Um, so to get started, I want to explain a little bit the motivation of why we did initial statement in heavy oscillations. So in this conference, of course, we're thinking about this and looking at light to form nuclei and what sort of structure information we can get from that. But the original motivation was quite different, is we wanted to understand what happens to the quarkulin plasma as we shrink our system size smaller and smaller. And you get a lot of different effects. It's very far from equilibrium. We wanted to see if hydrodynamics is still applicable. And in fact, in the very small systems, if we even produce a quarkulin plasma, or if there's some other states of matter. Now, at this point, there are other talks that, that shows that in the smaller systems, we have a much better handle at this point. And it looks like it's much more consistent with hydrodynamics. Um, but then it opens other questions in terms of this could be a very far from equilibrium system. And how does that mean? What does that mean for nuclear structure measurements? So to just kind of remind you, you've probably seen this picture a ton over this week, but what I really want to focus on is if we have, I'm trying to get this guy here, if we have our initial state, and this is our impact region here, and we have some sort of elliptical shape, or it could be some deformed shape, I don't really care what type of shape that is, how does that translate into my final state and actually connect to experimental observables? And so how well of a mapping do I have between my initial and final state? So just to be clear, this is right after the two ions have collided, and I use a different type of code than I do actually in my hydrodynamics. So it's an entirely different code, and then I feed that into hydrodynamics. That's my initial condition, and how does that relate to the final flow harmonic that I can compare directly to experimental data? And so that's the question that I'm really asking here. So first of all, um, just to be clear, there's a lot going on in our initial state. It's not just an energy density profile, all right? Um, what we can have is we can have out of equilibrium effects. And in fact, there's people in the audience here that work quite extensively on this, but you get this, uh, oh, wrong one. You get this pre-equilibrium phase here. And so you don't just get an energy density profile, but you get initial flow. You could get a shear um, and bulk pressure for instance, out of this sort of thing. And so there's a lot of effects that have nothing to do with to that, the actual geometry that can play a role here. You also get effects from the nuclear width that you need to take into account. You could get effects from substructure. You can see um, this sort of plot, but there's many out there uh, where you could have fluctuations and quarks and gluons. And so these type of things have been considered in the Bayesian analysis. You saw Vilke's talk earlier this week that discuss some of those things. But there are even other effects that haven't been studied quite as much, such as color, or flavor, or spin, or magnetic fields. So there's a, a number of uncertainties in our initial state that could affect not just from some sort of deformed system, but other sort of effects that could play a role. Now, the other thing too, and this is why we do all these Bayesian analyses, is that if you actually open a, uh, up the hood, and look at hydrodynamics in detail, that there are other effects that go into hydrodynamics as well. And so we have transport coefficients, that's shear and bulk viscosity that you've been hearing about a bit this week. You have the equation of state. At least at LHC and top rig energies, that's really well understood. Once you go to the lower beam energies, that's really up for grabs. Um, but thankfully, we're mostly looking at top energies so that the equation of state is very well known from lattice QC. Um, now, what is still uncertain are the equations of motion not so much the first order transport coefficients, but you can get higher order transport coefficients that are less certain and less known. And then even when we start higher dynamics or when we freeze out in higher dynamics, these are uncertainties that we have in our model. What we really wanna do is create observables that cancel all this stuff out. We wanna have things that are not dependent on the medium effects and really hone in onto the initial state. So in terms of what happens and in terms of the mapping of going from the initial to final state, when we shrink the system size, we need to think about this quite carefully. Um, for lead lead, this is a really fat nucleus. And we think about this as a large system. It's well-defined hydrodynamics. We've studied this quite a bit. But as we shrink our system size, this is, for instance, a proposed system size scan at the LHC. We've heard earlier today about oxygen 16, which is going to be ran next year. Xenon 129 was already ran. And there's also the possibility of argon-40, which is something that was in the yellow paper. So if we lived in a perfect world, we'd have linear response. What that means is from my initial state to my final state, there's just some scaling coefficient. You've seen a few people talk about this in their talks today. Um, but the problem is life isn't always perfect, and you can actually get nonlinear effects that show up in this mapping. And so this is something I'm going to dig into much more. Now, how, what role does it play when we play with different beam energies 
different system sizes. And this, what sort of role does this play with the nuclear structure? So that's something we need to study rather systematically. If we want to do precision better measurements, we have to have a good handle on these different issues. And also what sort of role do medium effects play? What kind of uncertainty does that add? And are there measurements that we can do to actually cancel that out? So to break this down, um, there was a, a Shuji's talk, talked a little bit about eccentricities. I want to get into more details of what that actually is. So essentially what you do is you just integrate over the density of your initial state. And then you have these weighting factors. So you have, oops, we're going to get up here. You have N, which is basically what you can think of relating to your flow harmonic. So if you have a factor of two here, that's your elliptical shape. And you think that's going to give you an elliptical geometry. Um, and that would relate to your final V2 that you've seen on slides. And so that would be here. If you have a really large eccentricity that equals one, it's extremely elliptical. It's basically a line. And if it equals zero, then you have a perfect circle. Right. The left hand side okay. also has a phase. You're not using it to the plus. Oh, yeah. This one I haven't actually, you're right. I, I, I will show the vector form, but right now I'm just talking about the pictures. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's actually going to be the next slide. Okay. Um, then you could have epsilon three, which describes the triangular shape, and you can have a square, which um, you can see here, that would be epsilon four. Now, Uli is completely correct that these are actually vectors. These are not just magnitudes. And this is something that you need to be very careful about when you're talking about the mapping. It's not just the absolute magnitude that's translated, but in fact, the angle that your, your ellipse or whatever is orientated in. And so that also maps to the final state. And so you can see here that we have different angles for the um, uh, epsilon two, epsilon three, and epsilon four. If you want the epsilon four bars to be one, then you need to cross, right? Uh, it's okay, you could, yeah, you could do a cross here instead. I was trying to do just simple shapes because I only have so many in keynote. <laughs> but I think you get the idea. So anyways, how does this actually look like when you run hydrodynamics? Well, you have your two ions here, they collide, and then the impact region gives you something quite a bit more exotic than the last pictures I showed you. There's some bumpy regime. Um, and of course, you can see here that there's some sort of dominant Oh, where's my here? Here it is. Some dominant elliptical shape, but there's certainly other structures that you would see in there. Yeah. What's the vertical axis? I have trouble reading the. Oh, this is energy density in GeV over 50 meter cubed. And the horizontal? This is um, the, the coordinate space. This is the transverse plane. Mm -hmm. So this is oh. X and Y in femtometers. And so basically, oh, again, pushing the wrong button. So basically what you see in hydrodynamics is when you have this elliptical shape, there's large pressure gradients that push you outwards. And they make you have then in the final state, this is just going over time. You see it starts pressing, pressing outwards to the sides. And eventually you get an elliptical shape here in your final state. And so this is why you see this relationship Vn is proportional to epsilon n. Is it just simply pressure gradients from hydrodynamics that is leading to that mapping? You can't see the end in this plot because it's only ten spatial density. Yeah, it's and spatial it's density. The end is a momentum. Yes. Measurement. Yeah, yeah, this is a momentum. So you would actually have momentum that affects this too. But this was a nice visual for this. Yeah. I'm a puzzle about the dynamics here because it looks like the the cordage, which is sort of going off up to the right, the spatial extent of that thing is not spreading out with this high pressure. Why doesn't it? Or is it that you've changed the the size of the grid? Um, so the size of the grid, I think, is the same, but the point here is that you're not pressing out this way nearly as much as you're pressing out the other direction. Uh -huh. You're also cooling at the same time, so you're not seeing necessarily how far it spreads out because it's cooled and spread out probably past the grid at that point. You can see here that oh, it actually I mean, goes... this is energy density. Yeah. Density. Yeah. All right, so what happens if I then look, if I run a bunch of hydrodynamic simulations, I compare my eccentricities to my final flow harmonics. If I do this um, for a fixed centrality class, so these are really head-on collisions, and I look at the eccentricities versus the flow harmonics, you get a nearly perfect straight line here, right? And so this is, again, why people were talking about linear mapping, is because this has such a nice, beautiful straight line in the very central collisions. Now, to be clear, I'm only using the magnitudes here, but you can do quantification of this 
more accurately, and I'll show this in a little bit with the full vectors, and you get the same result. So, how do you do this mapping? What we do is a Pearson correlation between the two is we take the eccentricity vector here with the, both the magnitude and angle. We take the final flow harmonic, both the magnitude and angle, and then we do um, simply a Pearson coefficient here. So essentially, if this is identically equal to one, it's a perfect linear mapping between the initial and final state. If it's zero, there's no correlation whatsoever. And if it's minus one, you have an angle correlation. And so what we can find, and I'll show you some more results in a second, is that V2 and V3 are mostly from linear response. However, if you start looking at other flow harmonics, like V1, it's extremely complicated. V4, there's, there's a lot of nonlinear arities in there. And so it's much, much more complicated. So when you start thinking about how a beta 4 would have mapped to a V4, that's a really non-trivial question. Think of it like that. So this works really well in head-on collisions. The problem is once you go to collisions that are like grazing collisions, these peripheral collisions, this starts to break down very, very quickly. Um, and so you can see here, there, in this original paper, they did this in peripheral collisions, and they started creating what we call these banana plots. So it starts curving upwards. And so in a later work, we found that this can be explained by having nonlinear response through a cubic term. And so it especially goes with epsilon to the cube. Um, it's a little more complicated because these are vectors, but still, that's the essential idea. And so then you don't just have one coefficient here, like this gamma. Other people show this as kappa. Um, but you have two separate coefficients that you have to obtain. And then you can actually do a really nice fitting to the experimental data. Or not just data, sorry. Self-consistent within the theory model. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what does this look like in terms of Pearson coefficients? Uh, let me show you first with just linear response. Uh, you can see we have a really excellent mapping. If we compare it first on the left for beam energy, this is, again, one is a perfect mapping from your initial to final state, and zero is no correlation. Oh, this thing is very weird for holding. Anyways, so if you compare by beam energies, lead, lead to gold, gold, in central collisions, it's nearly identical. So that's a great sign. If we're looking at rig central collisions, for V2, we should be really happy with a nearly perfect linear mapping. But we should really be cautious once we get to more peripheral collisions, around 40% centrality, this begins to break down. And we also see that RIC does a worse job in terms of linear mapping than LHC. So in fact, LHC gives you the best for a linear mapping out to larger centrality classes. Now the question is, what happens also for system size? Right, because especially if we're interested in these lighter nuclei, do we have a chance at getting at them with mostly linear behavior? And so if we go to very, very central collisions, you can see that they're nearly identical. We're talking about zero to five percent, but that behavior starts breaking down quite quickly. And so essentially the rule of thumb is larger systems has a better linear mapping, but lighter nuclei start breaking down much more quickly. So if we want to get something from light nuclei, we really need central collisions. That is the key part. We're not going to get it with peripheral collisions because then you get all these nonlinear effects that show up. So what about nonlinear response? Well, what can we get from this? Um, we essentially first looked at just this type of nonlinear response. So you have the leading order eccentricity plus this cubic term. And how does that vary, for instance, with beam energy? And so what you generally find is your, your leading order term, as you decrease your beam energy from top LHC to RIC, your linear term is decreasing. So you have less linear response. And then at the same time, as you go to low beam energies, you'll get more nonlinear response, All right? So even though you get a pretty decent Pearson correlation for linear response, you're still gradually decreasing your linear response and increasing your nonlinear response. Yeah. What are we correlating here again? This is all within a theoretical model. So it's with, it's the initial state, the shape of it, the geometry of this, to your final flow harmonic. So um, as we pointed out, this is actually momentum space, is how we calculate these, but it's just a four-year series of our particle spectrum. Yeah. They're, they're idea why I just into the 70 BSO almost at Ezekiel, right? Or... Oh, yeah, this is because we tried to, uh, we attempted to extract to lower beam energies. So I'm not really focusing on that too much in this talk. But the problem is, is because it varies so much at the LHC and then 
once you get to the GEV, GEV level, it's nearly flat, is that you get nearly identical results. There's, of course, other more complications you expect of larger beam or lower beam energies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm confused to, for example, it's, it's uh, head on collisions, that's the x axis. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the way to the x axis. I mean, the left is the, it's at the y axis. So, what does it mean to say that you have a 30%? 25% correlation, or the previous one was 80% correlation. What's correlated with what? This is how correlated the geometrical shape of your initial state is to your final, what you actually measure experimentally. The same harmonic. But the same harmonic. But these are, these are, plots are not the correlation. Correct. Your, yeah. I know, but the previous one was. Yeah. yeah those and you are, you are head on. So the only, the only, uh, only, I mean, there's the direction of the beam, and then all of transverse directions are the same. So what are you correlating here when you say 100%? You know, like the, the, the extent along the beam axis is the same, or correlated with the, the flow along the beam axis or the transverse? What's the correlation? So, so what you're correlating is the geometrical shape of the transverse plane. So you have like an energy density, and you calculate the eccentricity of that. So how elliptical is your initial condition? But there's no eccentricity of that for zero impact gravity. Oh, there there is always because there's fluctuations. It's event by event. And so because we're not talking about a complete spherical lead nucleus, you actually always have fluctuations. And so you, you always have finite eccentricities, even when you're in ultra ultra central collisions. So the exit, so it just says the fluctuations grow here then. Um let's hold that thought because we are going to talk about fluctuations yeah. a little bit farther. But it is true, you do get um, pretty significant fluctuations in certain regimes. Right. So then just to show you, um, if I take what I get from both my linear and nonlinear response, and I actually try and reproduce my flow harmonics, you can see here on the plot, the red lines are what I get from linear plus nonlinear response. And you see that I have some residual. This is this delta here. This is because there's other types of, of eccentricities or something else that is giving me that final flow harmonic that I can't encapsulate with this approach. So you can see in central collisions for both V2 and V3, I can get the vast majority of the flow harmonic, but after you get to more mid-central and peripheral, we start getting differences there. So we can't capture all of the behavior in mid-central to peripheral collisions. So what happens for other flow harmonics? Like I said, is there, I was mostly talking about V2 specifically for this one. For V3, there's also other higher um, order coefficients that would enter this. And so V3 was never as clean of a mapping as V2. V2 can get to like the 99th percentile, basically 98th percentile for certain centralities. But you can see here that um, for V3 in the very central, we do quite well. But if we just look at the leading order coefficient, it drops quite quickly with centrality. This is the bottom line here, even though I'm not that great with this pointer here. So then what you can do if you, if this is just a series that you can expand outwards and look at your other higher order coefficients. Um, and you find that there's two other coefficients that could play a role here. And if you add one systematically, you get closer. But of course, the best thing is if you add in all three um, eccentricities at once, but you still don't get perfect. Um, what's going on here? You still don't get perfect mapping. Now, what we're looking at here is mostly integrated VNs. This is what we've been using for a lot of the stuff with deformed systems, but you can also do your, your VNs um, versus VT as well, so the transverse momentum. And in fact, you can see here, this was recent results from, from Matt and his collaborators, um, where you get slightly different results in terms of what is preferred here versus what is preferred for the integrated. Um, so you have to kind of be careful what you're actually comparing to. But you do overall get the same picture that if you add in all the terms, you still get the best mapping here on both sides. So then what about nonlinear mapping across system size? And so this is another work that um, Matt and Maurice and Hippert and I and, and others from, from the extreme collaboration are hoping to get out at some point where we take the results that, that um, we ran for lead lead, xenon xenon, argon argon, and oxygen oxygen, and look at how good linear mapping, so this is this teal line here versus all the terms. And so if you're at lead lead and looking just at V2, it looks pretty good, although for V3 it starts breaking down a little bit. Um, xenon still does a pretty decent job 
But once you get to argon, argon, you're see, already seeing a lot of nonlinear effects. And once you get to oxygen, oxygen, there's even more nonlinear effects that are paid in the world. So these are things that we, it's not, I guess the point is, it's not good enough for light ions to just look at eccentricities alone, unless you do the whole nonlinear mapping. You have to just sit down and run hydrodynamics, is kind of the moral of the story here. <laughs> I like when I get cheered. <laughs> so, can I answer a dumb question? Yeah. So, suppose you wanted to look at this experimentally, mm -hmm. then uh, how would you know that if that parameter you've been determined by multiplicity or something? Yeah, everything is through multiplicity here. And, and so, you, what you're saying here is that you can go to zero impact parameter on lead and lead, you'll see some. Uh, non uniformity and uh, non cylindrical expansion mm -hmm. that will be reflective to some extent of some initial non uniform, uh, non uh, cylindrical behavior. Right. Yeah. Even, so basically, exactly. So if you have a super head on collision, impact parameter zero, you're still going to get very tiny fluctuations from a mostly circular shape. And those tiny fluctuations still map really well. Into the final state is what we're seeing here. Will it be a big effect in the data? Um, yeah, you can definitely measure the, measure this in the data. Okay. Um, what she did, she, she did this analysis on the level of the initial eccentricities to use these as predictors of the flow. You can also do it experimentally by looking at the flow itself <clears throat> and decomposing it into linear and nonlinear terms, and then ensure that these nonlinear terms as nonlinear mode coupling effect. Mm -hmm. It's just the representation, a uh, reflection of the fact that hydrodynamics is intrinsically a nonlinear field. Although in this case, it's a bit tricky, right? Because there's the correlation between the initial epsilon P and the epsilon N and TN and epsilon N, you cannot measure because it's something you can't initial. Measure. Yeah, yeah. So, this is a basically to understand your model a little bit better, right? right. Well, it's basically to see can I just take eccentricities or not? Or do I need to run full hydro? Yeah, yeah. I think that's really what I'm hoping here. Model. Um, but it is true. You can't get this exactly from data because you don't know your initial state. If you had a way to measure the geometrical shape of your initial state, then you could do that correlation. So can I ask you another mm -hmm. dumb question? Go How do you, can you define centrality experimentally? Well, so that's a question for this guy up front. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what we do in, in our model is we essentially make the assumption that there's a really good correlation between the entropy and the final multiplicity. And so we run millions of events, and then we bend by the entropy. Um, and this is how we determine centrality. And so if we, and we can compare to our final results too, that we get much larger multiplicities in what we've been as a central collision versus the peripheral collisions. And so we can compare like those distributions to experimental distributions as well. Um, and so if we do stuff like, I, I don't have it, but I do have it in one of my papers where we've plotted centrality versus the average multiplicity um, for each centrality and does a really good job. There's there's a uh, very detailed paper from at least collaboration that demonstrated or at least in their paper conclusions that in uh, LHC energy in the land land collision, you get a uh, uncertainty is like percentage is like less than 1%, almost all the way to 60 to 70% centrality. I can send you that piece of detail. Yeah, yeah. What is it for oxygen? Oxygen? Wow, well, uh, there, of course. So that is a good one. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, people no. Are this is a really good point because once you get to like really small systems like proton lead, mm -hmm. there's a lot more uncertainties. Oxygen, oxygen. The proton lead has no geometric interpretation, not a physical, no geometric interpretation at all. And for oxygen, oxygen, it starts to get very fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So this, then, then your question becomes serious. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But in the centrality in principle is defined by multiplicity. And that, of course, we could also compute. I mean, the entropy is a bit of a shortcut and it's, it works in general for most of the It's, it's, it's in common. Well, obviously, you cannot do that. You really have to look at the multiplicity. Yes, you can order the events by multiplicity, but they don't tell you about centrality in the geometric sense. No, they don't, right? But you don't need that in any system. Centrality right. is multiplicity, uh, not. Impact yeah. parameter. Yeah. You just stop yeah. Yeah. And then you have to understand yeah. that half of the community in this room interprets the word centrality literally as geometry. Yeah, but that's what we have to clarify. But we yeah. need we we just use multiplicity, yeah. right? and these bins are just ten percent bins of multiplicity. Yeah. Yeah. The zero to ten percent are the ten percent yeah. most 
highest multiplicity you've ever made. Makes sense. Yeah. All your events, you sort them. And then yeah. in both all the simulations and in yeah. the yes. like yeah. you don't, you don't, the assumption of uh, connection to impact parameter isn't built into any of the models. Right. You just, yeah. it just yeah. kind of comes out that they're technically correlated. Right. Right, but I like exactly. So when we do this, I never actually look at the incorrect parameter. I'm looking at the multiplicity. Yes. Um, it's buzzing for some reason. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so one other thing that, and I, I this has to be Dorn's work here, but I wanted to mention is what I've done up to this point is assume that we're just talking about eccentricity for initial state. Um, but you could also put in much more than the eccentricity or the initial energy density. You can put in out of equilibrium effects. So you can put in things like the initial flow. Um, you can put in out of equilibrium effects like a shear stress tensor or bulk pressure. And so what happens with this mapping as you go to very tiny systems? Um, as it turns out, then if you look at the mapping, I can get my pointer working over here, um, he got very similar results to us. Um, and sorry, actually, Chung and Kurt Wish are in the audience too, so I should mention them. So apologies. Um, and so here in central collisions, you have nearly perfect linear response. Um, but you can see as, as you go to more peripheral collisions, and these are lighter ions, um, then you see that you're getting other things affect. And in fact, what they found is the other effects are basically coming from this initial flow. Um, and so this is something that doesn't have to do with deformations, but it has to do with this push outwards that they're getting from their initial state. So there's other effects that we also have to consider beyond just geometrical, beyond just nonlinear effects. All right, so what does this actually mean for deformed ions? Is do we get the similar mapping when we're comparing de different deformations? Um, the good news is, is they are fairly similar. And so what we did here is this is for the isobar run. This was an earlier run before the data actually came out. So we have to kind of retune our data and, and rerun it now. Um, that being said, we ran different, this time just different beta 2 deformations and a few different radii. Um, and you can see that we get very, very similar mapping across the board. I mean, we're talking about very tiny differences here for V2. Uh, this is only for linear response. And also for V3, we see very similar results for our mapping. So it didn't look like the deformation played a huge role once we do our Pearson coefficient, which is good news. Oh, yes, two minutes? Two minutes until 10. Oh, okay. Two, wait, two minutes till until 10. Until 10. Got So I'm, I'm almost done here. Um, also, you can then get our look at our nonlinear coefficients here, and you can see that when it comes to deformation, actually the linear term is nearly identical. So that's good news. You do start to get a bit differences in nonlinear response depending on your, your parameter space. Um, and so that's where you see differences in nonlinear response. But fortunately, it's still dominant with linear response, so it doesn't have that big of a role. Uh, so one thing I want to talk about is how we could get rid of um, a lot of the medium effects and also go back to this question about fluctuations. And so one thing to keep in mind is when we have a fixed centrality, it's not that we measure a single V2, but we're always measuring a distribution of V2. And so we can think about different moments of this distribution. Um, and in fact, we actually talk about cumulants, but still you could, there's always some connection between the moments and the cumulants that you can work out. Um, and so one thing that works out quite nicely is you can take a ratio of Vn4 over Vn2, and this cancels a lot of the medium effects. Um, and if you only have linear response, in fact, it gives you exactly these eccentricities. So in the regime in very central collisions, where it's primarily linear response, this is a great thing to look at to just get at the initial geometry. And so, in fact, we did a study at um, impact parameters equal to zero, so absolutely as head-on as possible, and there was only a 1%, even less than 1% difference for V3, 4, V3, 2. So this is something that I think we should always be checking, because um, it's a lot cheaper to just run eccentricities than run the full hydro. So what does that look like? If I actually take the hydro results, these are these black dots here, and then I look at just linear response, which is in red, or linear plus nonlinear response in blue. And so you can see that um, linear response does decently well in central 5.02 TV. And in fact, all the, the really central collisions, even down to argon, although in oxygen, it, it's still, there's, a, there's too much nonlinear response in oxygen to really get at that just from eccentricities alone. That the blue line drops like it's going in the left. Is that a plotting artifact or is that weird? Oh, um, I think it actually switches sign. That's oh, why. Okay. And so what I did is instead of making it imaginary, <laughs> I just had a negative sign. Um, 
capital P. Um, but you can see that we do have nonlinear response. We do an excellent job. So if there's a way that we can keep track of that in models, uh, maybe we could do a shorter run and then use the nonlinear terms to actually do a much bigger run with eccentricity. So this is one way that we could do some sort of predictors here, even in small systems. Sorry, when you said E2 force, which is sign becomes imaginary. Yeah. E2 force power sign. Yeah, it becomes imaginary. So I just made it the convention where instead of doing imaginary, I just put the negative sign. Like day yeah, I mean, John Young actually has a paper where he, he redid this um, in Atlas. Okay, so one last thing I do want to get to, even though I know I'm pretty much out of time, is uh, we did have some results in oxygen oxygen with Dean, where we took his ab initial calculations and configurations, and we plugged this directly into hydrodynamics. Um, and so we wanted to kind of check three different scenarios. You have one that's just straight out of the box. This was the Duke Bayesian tune. Um, so just using Wood Saxon for oxygen and oxygen, and you run this in hydrodynamics with our best fit parameters. Then you have um, alpha clustering, which was in the ab initial calculations from lattice effective field theory. So you have clustering, and you can kind of think of this as we have smaller numbers when it comes to fluctuations. Whereas then, in contrast, we looked at stuff with subnucleonic um, structure. So you have maybe like quark or gluon degrees of freedom. So you have smaller scale fluctuations. And we wanted to see if we could understand differences between these three different scenarios. Um, and so this was a nice collaboration with experimentalists, theorists, my, my postdoc, Christopher, and then also Dean and his former I think, postdoc, yeah. And so what we found specifically is looking at a four-particle correlation. It's kind of a nasty looking observable. So it's the V4. Um, it's a four-particle correlation. And you do this to the fourth because of the sign change that I was talking about with Uli. Um, but that's just kind of how you define the observable. What we find essentially is that if you have um, the, let's start with the quark degrees of freedom. So you have the smallest scale fluctuations, then you would end up with something like here. Essentially what you're looking at is the V4 is fluctuating, ah, it's so hard to move this, is fluctuating the least. Then if you move to the wood section, which is more like nucleonic degrees of freedom, you have something intermediate. And then when you get to alpha clustering, you see very, very large fluctuations here at the bottom. And so this is something that if we run oxygen, oxygen, you can actually measure this in the data. Um, and so this is something I'd be quite interested in looking at in the future to see if we could actually measure something like alpha clustering in the data. That brings me to my, to my conclusions. I hopefully I gave you some idea of how we understand the mapping, why we've been talking about linear response, and how we can think about how a beta 2 or beta 3 or beta 4 deformation, how that affects our initial state and how that will lead to a final state and where we can really trust that versus other parts where we need to have other nonlinear effects or just from high dynamic straight up. So. Jackie, so uh, looking. So yesterday I showed a bit about linear response to epsilon 2 and V2 mm -hmm. for the isobars and what we show only 2% difference is quite significant and in your plot, you don't seem to reproduce it or it's in these nonlinear terms. So, did you check this? So, um, I don't know how to compare directly to yours, uh, but you would have to do a Pearson coefficient. So, the problem is you're just doing the magnitude in yours, and so you need to actually do the full um, vector correlation. Right, yeah. So, I, I can't really say until you do that. But you could plot the absolute to the I could plot that, yeah. 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 no, we didn't check Yeah, so you need to check the actual full vector correlation to see. Well, you could also deck. <laughs> but these are vectors, so you should do the full vector. <laughs> wow, we're not. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, can I go back? Yeah. Maybe a question just for this uh, simulation. How many events do you need to actually simulate to see those differences? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have to double check. It was probably at least in the. 30 to 60,000, which is normally what we run. Um, but I know this observable particularly does take a large number of events. So it's probably closer to like 60,000, but I can double check. It also depends a bit, like we actually cope with the formula P4 part from the early paper to use exactly that formula. And we have millions of events and we don't get this statistic. So I think you use like the F long 4 4, and then it's only the linear response is kind of a bit of a shortcut. No, it's not the final results. This is not from these interesting. You use a different use. Is that millions with the oversampling or one oversampling? Well, but we have like hundreds of thousands of hydro events, and then 10 times, 20 times all sampled, and we don't get it. Yeah, I mean, I can double check. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. 
it looks like you don't need a lot of <clears throat> experimental events to really see the difference. Okay. Yeah, I think so. So Anthony Timmons was on this paper and he did an estimate. Um, and he said, I mean, I can't remember how many events that you need experimentally, but he said that what they were anticipating for a week run should be more than sufficient to get this. Okay. Yeah. Good. How did you do alpha cluster? Oh, so <laughs> that is for a question for today. It's not so hard to yeah. We have a body densities. Yeah, so, so so we are producing configuration of the for everybody who wants to use it, we have it with a very simple interaction for a certain nuclei like alpha, like uh, object 16. But we're going to go through the nuclear chart, so we will have configurations in the near future for everybody. So when you put it in your in your calculation, mm -hmm. we just take the location of the nuclei. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So in in our code Trento, which a lot of people here use, um, you could just read an HCF5 file in of what Dean has. So my postdoc wrote basically an intermediate code that gets what Dean has and translates it into what we can use in Toronto. Um, so we're trying to make this publicly available in the future. Other questions? Yeah. So, so why you use new form? Ah, so we actually test a bunch of other observables here as well. This was the one that we found the most sensitive, which I think makes sense because it it sort of has this, you know, plus shape or something that you could get from the <clears throat> four alpha clusters. Um, yeah, but we tested a bunch of them. You do actually get differences in the ratios like V22 to V32 and V42 over V22. There's a, we took a bunch of ratios and um, there are other things that are sensitive, but this was like the clear separation. Okay. This, this is a naive question. Yeah. I, I just wonder how small can you actually push the uh, system size can you go to the program line? The program, program. For the mapping stuff? So? Yeah. Um, I mean, in principle, we can run it. Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder whether you're, you know, if you have this um, entropy and the um, multiplicity mapping, so I wonder how does your you know, entropy distribution compare to continuous duplicity calculations? Yeah, I think for that, you really need to just do the multiplicity directly. Exactly. Um, so I think at some point, that's that's not going to be a good yeah. mapping. Okay. I but, wonder how people do it. Right. So yeah. the, the main reason I do that is because I can get much finer centrality bins because I can run millions of events. Um, but in principle, I could do that in just straight up multiple stages. <laughs> That's really hilarious that you see this big effect. You think it's definitely measurable. Yeah. That was are you gonna get a deep that for it? I mean, this is, yeah, that was what the, the talks were this morning is that if they run it, this this you can get out. Um, so it's just, it's something already that they calculate. Um, they, in fact, have done this already, the exact measurement in lead 208. Uh, interesting fact, uh, I actually have a backup slide maybe on this. Um, no, unfortunately not. Um, but it doesn't fit the data for lead 208. So in fact, there's a sign change. Uh, I think the experiment, maybe Jen Young knows, Changes at what twenty percent, and I think all the the theory changes at forty percent centrality. It was three four four. Three four four. Yeah. Yeah. Three four four to the fourth. So, um, I should have put a backup slide on that. But there is so there's still we, questions we in like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I keep okay. asking Dean for configurations on this. I think one week uh, the pro prototype run they will have more data than you have events. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. So configuration for what? Uh, lead to eight. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Oh, there's. Oh, I don't yeah. Know yeah. yeah. Oh, on on this uh, paper, I just wanted to understand where is the experiment here on this paper? Or we don't have. One. We don't. So this is uh, this is these talks this morning about they're going to run oxygen and oxygen collisions at yeah. LHC. Yeah. So we are very eagerly waiting for this data. Um, but for a year now, it'll be 2024. <laughs> Do you really understand intuitively why for alpha you have this uh I mean, yeah, intuitively I would say that essentially when you have fluctuations, it goes with the number of kind of particles in your system. And so when you have subnucleonic fluctuations, you're sampling your system many, many, many times. So essentially you have less fluctuations. Whereas when you have alpha clustering, it's a finite number of particles, and then you get much wider fluctuations. And so Essentially, when you're getting these largely negative values, you're seeing very large fluctuations. But to explain that with negative sign, it's natural if these fluctuations are house and just to mm -hmm. at this yeah. definition gives you a negative mm -hmm. Yes. 
So when you when you do the wood section, you are actually not taking into account any kind of they just move on. Or yeah, that's what the nucleon is exactly. There's no alpha clustering at all in that. Right. So then why is wood saxon lower than when you do wood saxon plus four? Because um you're still get fluctuating because of the position of the nucleons. So you're doing a Monte Carlo sampling. So you have your wood saxon, but you're sampling the position of the nucleons within that wood saxon because you have event by event calculations. And so for every event, it's frozen in a different configuration. So you don't have alpha clustering, but you do have those type of fluctuations. When you have subnucleonic fluctuations, you don't just sample 208 nucleons for each lead nucleus, but you're sampling at many, many more spots. So you're getting something that's, I think, kind of wrong. So, so this needs to be my last question. Yeah. Uh, did you do this for lead? And do you see the same kind of lead too? Um, lead is no, we have to have that. That is exactly what I'm, I'm bothering you about. Yes. Okay. Uh, last question. Yeah. Is this, um, do pines contribute to this or not? Do you have exchange particles? Do they gather? Uh, so in the initial state, we don't include anything like pines. We just say that everything is frozen out. But it, we do have definitely pines in the final stage. So we have um, hydrodynamics, and then you run a hydronic, you particleize them, and then we run a hydronic afterburner. There's interactions there. And so there's pines, pines in your final state. Actually, most of your final state is pions. Okay, let's thank Jackie once again.